Hey guys, Comet here. Welcome to episode 22 in my Overly Scienced series. Now this will probably be, barring any good suggestions in the comments, the last episode in the series. I'm just running out of things to science at this point. I will be starting another survival series. It will probably be kind of the opposite of the science series. I kind of had everything planned out from the beginning. I picked the map very specifically. And I think in the next series, what I would do is just pick a map that I haven't really done before, like the volcano one, do a random seed, take what I'm given, and then just try and figure things out from there. I think that might contrast what I did in this series very well. Now, in addition to that, I have been thinking about other games to branch out to. Now, I got most of my subscribers all this year because of this game, and it would be kind of rude to just completely switch games. So I would continue doing Onivids, but I'm thinking I could do maybe Factorio or Satisfactory, because those games are pretty similar to this one. I think they would entertain the same audience. But anyway, the focus of this video is the rocket chimney. So if I zoom out here, I've got eight rockets that are all 40 blocks tall. So the total height on this rocket chimney here is just 40 times eight, which is 360 tiles tall. And that's going to be important later. Let me just go over the plumbing here really quickly. Because um, these pipes are going to be in really hot steam, you want to either make these out of insulation or ceramic. And you want to keep most of the piping off by itself over here and not inside the tube. So the pipes only come in here when it's absolutely necessary. And then they pop back out over here to continue on up. So all of these rockets have both hydrogen and oxygen going to them. And I have limited the flow using these valves because I kept getting uh, breaks in the pipe. And I didn't want to focus too much on the piping in this video because, you know, this... This is about the chimney, not the piping to the chimney. And just a warning, there is going to be a lot of math in this video. There's no way around that. So we're going to start with number of rockets here in Excel. So I've got eight, and they are all 40 blocks tall. So the total height of the chimney is just going to equal this times this. Oh, it's 320, not 360, my bad. So the way you need to think about this, this first rocket here, it has the full chimney's worth of space to give off steam. And then this rocket here has 40 blocks less of space to give off steam. And then this one up here has 40 less than the one before it. And it keeps going like that. So to get the total run of the chimney for each rocket, it's kind of similar to doing a bounded integration of 1 over x, but I never really liked calculus, so we're going to stay away from calculus. So the layman's way of doing this is by summing all of the different heights of the rockets. So rocket 1, we will call this bottom one down here, and then rocket 2 is here, rocket 3 is here, and so forth. So rocket 1... We'll call this the runway. It's going to have this height right there. So that square just equals this square. Now rocket two, it's going to have this tile or this cell minus the height of the rocket multiplied by the rocket number minus one. And this right here needs to be in parentheses. Got to make sure we get the order of operations correct here. And then we can take this cell and copy it down. And if we fill in these numbers here, ah, I see here. So this, it's trying to grab a value from here. So I gotta put 40 for all of these. Okay, I take that back. This cell is going to equal the value above it minus the height of that rocket. Now we can copy this and paste it down. There we go. And so this will work if you change the height of your rockets here. So let's say instead of having a 40 tall, let's say we have one with only two liquid fuel tanks. We can see how that changes the numbers here. So I'll put that back because all of my rockets are 40 tall. And I do that because, let's see if I control F4, yep, star map. By using a rocket that is 40 blocks tall, I can send it to this planet. 
or I could send it way out to a planet over here, and I don't need to reconfigure the rocket. I just change how much fuel I put into it. And that way I can have any rocket go to any planet. It's just simpler for me. But if you like to have different sized rockets, then you have to take that into consideration here. And if you are doing something like this, it's important to have the rocket at the very bottom go to the closest planet rather than the furthest away planet because it's going to have the most turnaround or the shortest period and you want to take advantage of that extra height with the rocket that has the shortest period. So if you're going to the really far or the really distant planets, you want to use this top rocket. And I guess while I'm here, I could explain this scanner setup. It's what I did in my survival map. I just have all of these scanners connected up. So these all search for the first rocket and then this second column searches for the next rocket. And there's six scanners in a column, and then they all just connect into these doors here. So when any of these rockets are returning, it's gonna open the doors. And by linking six scanners together for one object, even with uh, zero visibility, you can always open and close the doors in time. So this will work even for meteorites. It's actually a slight problem here. This needs to be the sum of all of this. Oh dear, what did I just do? Parentheses? Yes. The sum of this. It doesn't change any of these numbers, but it's it's more accurate, because then if you change, you know, this to 10, that's the smallest rocket possible, right? It changes everything else. Okay, so what's the next piece of data we need? It would be steam per slice. And that will make sense here once I jump back to... The game. So what I consider to be a slice is this cross section right here. It's nine tiles wide. And if we can figure out or get a good estimate of how much steam a single launch will fit right here, we can double it because the rocket has to go out and come back and then multiply it by the runway that that rocket has. So to get a good idea, what I'm going to do first is launch this rocket here. So let's send you to this first planet here. I need to figure out how much fuel to put in there. So if I go to the rocket calculator, select hydrogen. This is doing two cargo bays and a distance of 1000. And it has three of these. So 277 of fuel and oxidizer. So we can do 277 and 277. And we'll let that fill up. And then I can come up here, manually open the door, and this little block right here is important, otherwise you'd have a buildup of regolith down at the bottom in this column here. And it doesn't happen on this side because, well, this is nine blocks wide and the doors can only take up eight tiles, so there's this extra block here. Okay, so this is full. I'm gonna go ahead and send it off. And we need to see how much steam we get in here. I'm not going to worry about having uh, double doors at the top because the steam that I'm losing isn't really that big of a deal compared to how much automation would need to go in to get the uh, second layer of doors to open. And if you're wondering what I'm talking about, it is using mechanical airlocks because they open and close more quickly than bunker doors will. So if we look at the middle of the tube here, it's about 554 through most of it. So if we multiply that by two, we get about 1,100 grams of steam per tile. And if we multiply that by 9, we get 10 kilograms per slice. So we can put that over here. This is 10 kilograms, and we're going to keep everything in kilos. That way it's easier. So the steam output of the rockets can go in this column here. And we're just going to take the output per slice multiplied by its runway. So this will be 10 all the way down. And then we can take this formula and copy and paste it. So this is good. We've got how much each rocket will produce each launch, but we want this in kilos per second. So what we can do, we can take a look at the period 
of these rockets here. So this rocket going to the closest planet takes 2.7 cycles. So if we put the period in here of 2.7, we can get an average kilograms per second over here by doing the steam output of rocket one divided by the cycles divided by the 600 seconds in a cycle. That number does not look correct. I think this is supposed to be a multiplication. There we go, that looks better. And let's let's not round to that many numbers. Let's bring that, yeah, that looks nice. And then over here, this would be the total theoretical, theoretical output of the entire chimney. So we need to go through and figure out where these other rockets are going to be going so that we can come up with a period here. So let's say this rocket here, it's going to go to the second carbon asteroid here. It's going to have the same period because it's the same distance away. So we can do 2.7 here as well. And then we can actually copy this formula down all the way here. Now you notice this isn't the same, even though it's going to the same distance. That's because it has less runway. So we can fill this up to the 277 and the 277 and then get this rocket launched. And then this one here, the third rocket, we can send out to this metallic asteroid and we'll see the period on that distance. But first let's see how much fuel we actually need to put in it. 430 kilos of each. So rocket three here is gonna have 430. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch these simultaneously here. I'll launch this one here. I'm gonna launch rocket three to this planet here. And you do wanna synchronize their takeoff. That way you can minimize the time that the doors at the top are open. So let's check and see how long this one will take here. 5.4, no, 5.5. So we can go ahead and put 5.5 here. And let's say we send this one to the same distance as well. So for the sake of overbuilding, I'm gonna say that these remaining rockets are going to the closest asteroids. And this should help give a number for overbuilding in case you have more rockets in the chimney than I do. Like instead of using 40 block tall rockets, maybe you're using only 20 block tall rockets. So when we put all these numbers in, the total theoretical output of the entire chimney is eight kilos of water per second. Now, what do we do with that number now that we have it? Well, we can figure out how many steam turbines we need extracting water, and then we can figure out how many steam turbines we have cooling down the water. So with eight kilos a second, the number of extra extractors we would need is just equal to that divided by two. And we will round this as well, because each steam turbine can do two kilos a second, four extractors should be able to keep up with eight kilos. And then for the number of coolers we would need, well, this calculation is a little, little more difficult. We need to take the mass output here, the eight kilos, and multiply it by the temperature that it leaves the engine. I'm almost certain that it is 1500 degrees. And I think I can double check by launching this rocket here. So let's launch this rocket and then take a look at its exhaust. So the steam here is at 1700 degrees. Okay, 1500, 1100, oh, it's 1500 here. Can I see the steam in there? 1500, we do wanna overbuild this. So let's say it comes out at 1700. So the formula for the number of coolers would be this eight kilos multiplied by the temperature it leaves divided by the total DTUs that a steam turbine can delete. So I'm gonna copy this number here and paste it into here. And it doesn't like commas for some reason. Ah, this needs to be a division. Don't forget to multiply by the specific heat capacity of water. That's important. Ah, right, this is in kilos, so we would need to use this number for the specific heat capacity. That's more like it. And we can't have 0.4 of a cooler, so let's round that. So the total number of steam turbines would be this plus this. And then actually 
There's one more thing that most people don't think of that I just thought of right now. We need the steam turbines that cool the steam turbines. Uh, I don't know what to call this. Extra coolers. So for every 15 steam turbines, you'd need an extra steam turbine that it deletes the heat that the other steam turbines make. So actually this is in the wrong spot. I don't like that. Nope. Wait a minute. That was right. We need to take this formula, paste it here. No, not that formula. We need to take... There we go. And then divide this by 15. Don't forget PEMDAS. Here we go. Now we can take this plus that plus that. So 36 total. So we've planned all the work. Now we got to go work the plan. And I've got a couple ideas for this. So if we come up maybe about here, I'm thinking we use some doors to let heat into a steam room. So we would need 30 doing that and then four actually collecting the steam. And I've got eight rockets, but most of the steam is gonna be concentrated near the bottom. If we take 30 and divide that by four, so every eight coolers, I will put in an extractor. I think that'll look nice. So we can start, I guess right at the bottom here, we can put in a steam turbine with a door here. And actually, let's move this over to here. And you'll see why in just a second. Gotta get these all connected up. And we need to put metal tiles right here. And of course, some shift plates. And then to make things look pretty, the drywall. So there's two conditions where I want this door to run. One will be if the steam in here is too cold. And the second will be if the steam out here is warm enough. So for the materials in the chimney over here, I'm going to make entirely out of steel. And then over here, I think it's okay to be iron. So let's get an AND gate. We can do something like this. This wire can connect into there. This wire connects into there. And this wire connects into there. So I don't need those. If the temperature in this room or if the temperature of this steam, let's let's get some steam in there. We want pretty stable temperatures, so let's do 500 kilos at 130. And fill this up. And you see, that closes the door. So if this is ever below 190, we want to engage the door and pull some heat into this room. Now, if there's no heat over here, because we haven't been launching rockets, then the steam won't be warm enough to get sucked up by the steam turbines that are doing the extracting. So only if this is above 200 will it allow this door to close. Uh, below 200? I forgot. Doors are inverted. So we can, instead of, in oh, damn it. Instead of using an AND gate and then inverting the output, we can just use an OR gate because they are logically identical. And I'm going to try and hide it here in the floor. So this is going to come over here, it's going to come over here, and then that can plug in there. Now we have to flip the uh, trigger on this. So if this is ever above 190, and if this is ever above 200. Below 200? Yes, so if this ever goes above 200, or this ever goes below 200, the door will be disengaged because it will be receiving a green signal. It's a little backwards to think about, but that's how you set it up. Okay, now the output on this steam turbine. I need to put it here, closest to the hot spot. Would it look better if I flipped this? I think it might look better if I flipped this. Then we can just come straight down like that. And I'm actually going to put in some hydrogen in here. Let's go 0 Celsius and 20 kilos. So then this will start working, producing power. And then the final thing you may, might want to do using either diamond or steel, I suppose you could go crazy and use thermium, but eh. You want to line, especially right around the door, you want to line this area with some temperature shift plates. But since it's sandbox, I'm just going to go crazy. Now I need to make eight more of these units and then put in the extractor. And I'll show you how to build the extractor when I get to that point. Okay, so all of these coolers are connected up now, but what do we do about the extractor? Well, Brothgar did a video on this 
concept where you have mechanized airlocks beneath a steam turbine that block the inputs. So as the temperature of the steam increases, you want to block more and more of these airlocks. And then the water can come out this way. I don't know why I I don't know why I sent it this way. That was dumb. We can send this down over to the electrolyzer setup that would be in place of these two tanks here. I'll just send it up into space for now. I don't know what else to do with it. There we go. So what you want to set these to, 200 on the one all the way in the corner, 225 on the second one, 269 on the third one, 354, and then 356. And make sure they are all below. And what this is going to do, this is going to prevent the steam turbine from destroying heat because its max output is 850 watts. So if you burn steam that's too hot, then you're essentially just wasting the heat. I mean, we don't want to be doing that. So I can go over the derivation of those numbers here. And a single steam turbine can remove this many DTUs at max capacity. And well, that number is different than what I got over... Oh, this is for two. Whoopsies. Well, that means this is wrong. This is 877590. Oh, that's a lot of steam turbines. Well, that was actually a big mistake I made here. But again, that is if you're running, you know, this chimney at the maximum. Okay, so back to, back to what I was saying. At 850 watts, a steam turbine is converting this many DTUs. So I guess I should flip the arrow. The arrow should go this way. So eight... Seven, seven, five, nine, zero. DTUs. A steam turbine has five inlets, and the maximum throughput on a steam turbine is two kilos. So if we take the two kilos and divide by five, so 2,000 divided by five, that gives us 400 grams per inlet. So if we have 400 grams of water, multiplied by its specific heat capacity of 4.179, multiplied by x minus 95, because that's what temperature it leaves the turbine at, equals 877590 DTUs. So we can simplify by just multiplying the mass by the specific heat capacity, which gives 1671.6. Then we still have this factor here, equal to this side, which hasn't changed. Now we can divide both sides by this factor. That reduces there. And we are left with x minus 95. So we divide 877.590 by 1671.6. That gives 525. Now to solve for x, all we do is add 95 to both sides. And that gives 620. So it looks like Brothgar was actually incorrect here. So this first one should be set to 620. Then the second one, actually I'm going to do the math on all of these. I don't I don't trust his calculations now. So for inlet 2, we would just use 800 grams instead. The second one should be set to 357, which is basically what he got. And then for three inlets, 270, he got 269. Okay, it looks like only the first one was wrong. So I'll set this to below 270. And then this one is 225, and then the last one below 200. So if for any reason there is steam in here that is above 620 degrees, none of these doors will be open because this steam turbine would be wasting that heat by reducing the temperature of the steam down to 95 degrees when its maximum output is only 850 watts. So that's this setup here. Now, none of these should be maxed out. And that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we could fit another seven of these, and then we would need a steam turbine to cool all of them. So I'll go ahead and put that in. Okay, so this is the pattern that I've come up with so far. It is seven coolers, then an extractor, and then seven more coolers. And then this one on top is the steam turbine that cools all of the other steam turbines. So we can see it working here. All of them should be pretty much maxed out, but none of them should be over the max. Okay, this one for some reason, it's a little warm. 
but this one got too cold, so it went ahead and closed that door and sucked in some more heat because it's warm enough out here. So the ratio here is 14 coolers to one extractor to one extra steam turbine to cool everything off. So that's a total of 16 steam turbines, which means when we tile this four times, that should be the 64 steam turbines we need about. I don't know if I can actually fit the full 69. It'd be nice if I could though. So really, you could just tile this alongside your rocket chimney, and all of the ratios should work out for pretty much any rocket setup you have inside the chimney. Oh, and one last thing, this is how I routed the cooling loop. So it's just one loop that touches everything. And then I think the very last thing I've got to deal with here is the carbon dioxide. So eventually, there will be a big pool of carbon dioxide down here that you'll have to deal with. So one way of dealing with that, I'm just gonna get rid of this heat block. I don't think I need it. What you can do, using some gas pumps made of thermium, because they're gonna be right underneath a rocket, put in some gas pumps like this to get rid of that carbon dioxide that you don't want. And the way you'd set up the automation, you'd need one gas element sensor. We don't want it to be right underneath where the exhaust comes out. So we'll put one here and then one down here. For some reason, gases like to pool more on the right, so you do something like this, you ore them together, and then invert it. This will actually give you an AND gate, and it looks a little bit cleaner. Then if you set- this is kind of counterintuitive, but because of the way the automation is set up here, if you set both of these to steam, the only way this NOT gate can send a green signal is when this is sending a red signal, and this is sending a red signal. So if they are both not detecting steam, which means they're detecting carbon dioxide, then they will activate and pump out that carbon dioxide. Now, wh what's the point of this one up here? Well, it ensures that this square in here is solid carbon dioxide, and there's no steam floating around in here that you pump out, because you want to recapture that steam using this turbine. So let me connect these up to some power here, and we should see that it works once this gets full of carbon dioxide. So I'm gonna send all this junk up to space. And actually, to be extra careful here, I think I'm actually going to set up some more... Let's hide the wiring. Like that. There. That way, this whole square here, not just this column here, that should prevent any steam from escaping. So this is working as intended now. This is extracting steam, and the rest are cooling off the chimney. Something worth noting might be that this turbine, even though its power output is near the max, its liquid output is less than half. So it might be a good idea to actually put in extra extractors than what you think you might need. But given that the whole design is overbuilt anyway, I think you'll be okay. So if I were to build a rocket chimney in a survival base, I would do something very similar to this. Remembering all of the math that I did in the beginning to get an idea of what the final project should look like. I don't know if I could actually fit four of these. I think I can only fit one more of them, actually. But it is overbuilt, so I think that's okay. So I'll go over the temperatures here one last time, because I think this is the most complicated part, actually. This first one should be set to below 620, second one below 357, third one below 270, fourth one below 225, and fifth one below 200. Now, having these open areas here on the side of the silo does present a problem if a meteor can get the perfect trajectory coming down slowly moving across and then striking right here it is a possibility but the chances of that happening are so astronomically low that i'm not sure it's worth putting in a robo miner and if you want to avoid that problem entirely then the safest place to put the extractor would be near the top, because that angle would need to be very extreme for the meteor to actually get lodged in the side. One final note is all of this carbon dioxide that likes to pile up here by the extractor. If you make a left-handed chimney, so if you made it on this side of the map where everything was mirrored, this would not be a problem, because the carbon dioxide tends to float down and to the right, so with the steam turbine being over here on this side, right, the carbon dioxide would flow out this way and then come down the chimney. 
but since this is built on the left side, the carbon dioxide likes to butt up against this far wall. I don't think that's actually too big of a problem. As long as the steam can flow across the top up here, it shouldn't interfere with the steam turbine. So I don't think this is actually too big of a problem. I'm going to launch a bunch of rockets and stress test this and see how it performs. Oh, this is finally turned on. So all of these are red now. So we take a look at the automation. That is the only time this can be green. So instead of setting up a big AND gate, you can just do a knotted OR gate, which is essentially an AND gate. Something seems to be wrong with these two. I don't know why they are so hot. These doors shouldn't be conducting any heat, but it looks like they got glitched out for some reason. Yeah, this one did as well. The doors should not be able to transfer any heat when they're closed or open, but for some reason they do anyway. I don't think it's because of this automation. I don't think heat can transfer through this AND gate, so it's probably just a door glitch. But that can be a little dangerous if they're all glitched out, because then, um, like this one for example, it's producing more heat than anticipated. So this up here won't be able to keep up with the extra heat that's being made because of that door glitch. So I don't think that's a problem with my design. I think that's just a problem with the game because these are cooling back off now. So yeah, a quick reset on the door, and it looks like it's behaving properly again. Okay, I've found the problem that's causing the doors to sometimes transfer heat when they're not supposed to. It's because they were unpowered. So I've gone ahead and powered all of them, and it's actually okay to put them all on the same line, even though it's theoretically possible for them to all go at the same time. It won't happen in practice, so you'll never really be overloading it. So this seems to be a very robust design now. We can deal with the carbon dioxide, we deal with the heat, and we deal with the excess water. So I can go over some final numbers here. Let's say all I do is double this, because that's really all I have room for. We've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 steam turbines. So we'll double that. That gives 32. And let's say they're running not at full, but about 800 watts. That's 25 kilowatts worth of power, which is basically the same as my regolith melter. I guess I do need to subtract out the power used on this aqua tuner and the power used in the electrolyzers. So we can subtract this and electrolyzers use 120 watts. So there's four electrolyzers and then there's six gas pumps, which use 240 watts. So minus, let's see, 120 times 4, minus 240 times 6. So even with all the electrolyzers, you're producing about 22 and a half kilowatts of power. And if you combine that with the regolith melter, which is also rocket powered, um, I don't know if I'd be able to do that with this setup. I would need a special way of getting the carbon dioxide out if I wanted to have a diamond block here to melt regolith for a regolith melter. But if I do f figure all the logistics out of for that, you can add... Well, actually, just multiply that by 2. 22480 times 2. You're basically at the maximum for a heavy watt conductive wire. Now, I think I'll go over the fuel efficiency of this whole thing. Because you have to remember, you don't get to recover the entire mass of the water you get back as hydrogen. And right now it looks like this is running at only two-fifths capacity. Usually it runs at about three-fifths. So if we assume that for all of the extractors. So if we have four extractors running at three-fifths capacity, we get about 4,800 grams per second of water back. And if you remember back to, I think episode five is where I went over some of the stoichiometry involved in electrolysis. You can see that you only recapture about 11% of the mass back in hydrogen. So this would be the limiting factor in refueling these rockets. So as long as what it costs to fuel the rockets in hydrogen is less than 540, the whole system is water positive. So we have six rockets with a period of 2.7 and two rockets with a period of 5.5.
So if we go back to how much fuel that all takes, that's a 277 hydrogen in the near ones and 587 on the more distant ones. So we can take fuel required to go to 2.7 is 277. And for these more distant ones, it's 587. Then we can divide that number by the period to get the fuel per second instead of uh, fuel per trip. So this is going to equal this divided by the period divided by 600. And we're gonna copy that formula down. And let's make these a little nicer to look at. So total would just be the sum of all of these. So then the total hydrogen output here, we can just take 540, which we calculated earlier, and multiply it by how much hydrogen we can actually recapture from the total output water. We get 60 a second. So with this whole system, you can turn 1.3 kilos into 60 kilos, which is a multiplication factor of 46. So you get 46 times the fuel back than what you put into the system, which is actually insane. Like the main way of multiplying water before was just using petroleum generators and a petroleum boiler. But you can get 46 times the fuel. That's not 46 times the water, but 46 times just the hydrogen, which is only 11% of the total mass that you recover back. So I can put that back over here. So total water a second. I'm running out of screen here. This is 540. So this, actually, I need to change this equation. This equals that times. There we go. So what did we learn? Rocket chimneys. Fantastic. You get tons of power and tons of water back out. One question I'm probably going to get is why don't I just use extractors for everything if you can limit their flow? And that's because the steam in here will overpower all of these if they're just extractors. You need some way of cooling the water off before running it through an extractor. So that's what all of these other steam turbines do because it comes out of the engine so hot. So extractors alone wouldn't be able to do anything because even with these temperature sensors here, uh, limiting the input steam, this sensor here would just limit everything. No steam would be able to go in because it'd be too hot. The stress test has actually revealed a slight problem. This single aqua tuner and steam turbine cannot keep up with all of these steam turbines. So I think final ratio here, it is seven coolers with one extractor and one temperature regulator setup. So that would be seven plus one plus one, so nine. You'd have nine of these and they are eight tiles tall. So nine times eight. Each module would be 72 blocks tall. And this chimney is 32 block, 320 blocks tall. So 320 divided by 72. You should fit four of them. And I think that setup should handle pretty much any rocket setup you have in the chimney here. Right, getting that ratio is really important because if you have too many coolers, then you have a lot of steam turbines sitting around doing nothing. Right, that's just wasted space. And if you have too many extractors, then the extractors are actually going to be interfering with each other because that space could be used instead on a cooler, which essentially opens more ports on the extractor, which is the same thing as having more extractors. So by putting in more coolers, you have to put in fewer extractors because they run more efficiently. Kind of a roundabout way of putting in more extractors, I guess. So I'll do one last overview of everything here. I got the plumbing. I'm limiting it. If you're using insulation, you don't have to limit it. Then it runs up this way, and it enters all of the rockets. I've got all of these space scanners here detecting the rockets. I've got six per rocket, and they're all just oared together into these doors up here. The setup on the cooler looks like this. This is the automation overlay. This is an AND gate right here. This is set to send a green signal when the steam over here is below 200. And this is set to send a green signal when the steam in here is above 190. And these two control this door. Now the plumbing overlay here, it just comes straight down out of the steam turbine into a vent here. I've got copper shift plates in the steam room and in the hydrogen room. And then I stack seven coolers on top of each other. Then I get to an extractor. The plumbing overlay on the extractor looks like this. The automation overlay looks like this. 
This thermosensor is set to send a green signal when the steam is below 620. This one when the steam is below 357, 270, 225, and 200. And these just keep the steam turbine from deleting extra heat that's in the steam. Then after the extractor, you're going to want to put in a temperature regulator, which controls the cooling loop. And this is just set to cool the steam turbines down to 80 degrees because it's in a vacuum. But if you have, you know, an atmosphere on this side, you can set it lower, maybe 25. And then after that, I would do another seven coolers. So the tileable pattern is seven coolers, one extractor, one temperature regulator. And then you just stack that up alongside the chimney. And you should be good to go with no matter how many rockets you have in there. It's about all I wanted to cover in this episode. I hope you learned something. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one.